Hey, you guys, it's Kim. Welcome back to the control variable. So this is our last episode for the season. That's a pretty good morning to be recording from where I'm sitting. It's still a while before dawn here in upstate New York. It's chilly out, but I've got hot coffee and some surprisingly good news about the midterm elections here, keeping me warm this morning. So as you all know, the midterms were held on Tuesday and tensions leading up to the election were high. It was the first big test of our democracy since the attack on the Capitol on January 6th of last year. Most Democrats I knew were scared. The media forecasted a massive Republican victory. The red wave, they called it. Some warned of the red tsunami. But that didn't happen. Not the red tsunami, not the red wave. Results are still coming in as of this recording. So we still don't know for sure who's going to take control of Congress in either the House or the Senate. Things are still neck and neck between Republicans and Democrats. But that is much better news than most of us on the left expected. Democrats showed up. Incumbent Democratic Senator Maggie Hassan held her ground in New Hampshire. Democratic Reps Abigail Spomberger and Jennifer Wexton held on in suburban Virginia. Senate nominee John Fetterman won his Senate seat in rural Pennsylvania, the heart of Trump country. True, as of this recording, 210 Republicans who openly question the results of the 2020 presidential election have won seats in the U.S. House and Senate and in state races for governor, secretary of state, and attorney general. Trump himself is widely expected to announce his run for president in 2024 next week. True, Marjorie Taylor Greene is still in charge down in Georgia. Ron DeSantis is still the boss in Florida. And J.D. Vance is now singing his hillbilly elegy in Ohio. But generally, when you consider how midterms tend to go, like when you consider that the party that won the most recent presidential election tends to get creamed in the midterm elections, things could have been worse. A lot worse. Only 41% of Americans approve of the job Joe Biden's currently doing as our president right now. Only 18% of us think the country is headed in the right direction. People aren't happy about the rising cost of gas and food. But apparently, a lot of us are also unhappy about the state of women's reproductive rights in this country, about the fact that Roe v. Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court last summer, the fact that a woman's constitutional right to decide whether or not she should bear a child, and in many cases, even her right to receive life-saving reproductive care, has been revoked and placed in the hands of the state government. Democrats across the country turned out to vote in record numbers in the midterm elections this week many citing women's right to abortion as their top concern in exit polls. As Republican Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina said, it was not a Republican wave, that's for darn sure. So things are looking up a little bit, which makes this a good time for the control variable to go on a break. We evaluate what we've done and how we're going to continue. When I first started the control variable just about a year ago, the thing I wanted to understand most was how we Americans got to be so divided. How we got to this point where so many of us believed Donald Trump's lie that the 2020 election had been stolen from him. And not only did they believe it, they were so infuriated, so outraged and terrified that they attacked the nation's capital, the seat of our democracy, on January 6th. I wanted to know about the propaganda that led up to that day, what stories people had been told, how those stories worked, why they had such power. I learned a lot during my investigation, and I came away with a whole lot of new questions. The biggest one of which was, what now? Like, if this whole story we white Americans were raised with is kind of inherently misguided, is deeply racist and misogynist and cruel, which I believe it is, what do we do? Who are we without it? What story do we tell ourselves now? Those are the questions I find myself asking most often these days, which is why I'm very excited about my guest on today's show, our last for the season, because she's someone who's had to grapple with these same questions and someone who understands the political divide in this country all too well. You might even say she's lived it. So her name is Gina Kadlec, and she just published a powerful memoir called Heretic about growing up in a Christian evangelical household in the Midwest. She was devoutly Christian as a kid married a pastor's son at 23, planned to live out the rest of her life as a good fundamentalist Christian lady. The whole thing. But somewhere along the way, Gina started having questions, doubts. She went to graduate school in Boston, started reading feminist theory, realized she was queer, 
realized the religion she'd grown up with was deeply invested in policing women, in teaching women to obey men, to be ashamed of their bodies, their power, their unique intelligence. And the result of these realizations is her stunning new memoir, Heretic, in which Gina writes about her experience of leaving the church and coming out as a lesbian and having to carve out a whole new identity for herself. As a woman, yes, but also as a soul and as an American. I wanted to talk to Gina because she watched the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. And as she watched, she recognized the God the rioters were invoking as the same God she'd grown up with in the evangelical church. Gina knows a lot about the history of evangelicism here in America. She writes insightfully about the relationship between evangelical Christianity and the propaganda that Donald Trump used to incite the insurrection on January 6th. She shows how deeply Christian fundamentalism is woven into our country's story and its misogyny and its racism. Happily, I can report that Gina got out. These days, she lives with her partner in Brooklyn. She's a writer and an astrologer, a weirdo, in a way that feels really authentic and true. Like a lot of us, she misses the community she had growing up in the church, the sense of joy she felt as a kid, believing in a higher power. Above all, she's really clear that things need to change. So here's my talk with Gina. Once again, thank you so much for for being here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and I just lo- absolutely loved your book. I was really, really moved by it. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. I'm so excited to to get to talk with you today. You write beautifully about spirituality and about sort of like, you have this beautiful passage where you talk about, I'm just going to quote it, where you say, the walks and bike rides I took down to the lake, to Cemetery Island, where it was just me and him and the rustling of leaves and my own tears as I poured my heart out to my Savior in the privacy of nature or in my own bedroom with my journals. I could escape the rules and surveillance of our big church. I could feel fully safe, loved, and held. That's very moving and, and very sort of wonderfully unreligious mm-hmm. in in a way, which sort of strikes me as the core of, of what you've sort of retained. But it sounds like basically with your father's baptism that all of that really started to shift and that the, the difference between that sort of very deep, tender sort of spiritual love and the actual existence practice of religion in your life really separated. So I was thinking maybe you could tell us the story about your dad's baptism, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the just a, a very brief amount of context there being that, yeah, that, that growing up, uh, my mom was the one who took us to church. We actually did go to a Dutch reformed church very, uh, for a little bit when I was really little, that was the country church that I, that I talk about going to. So, so we had, cause we, because we moved a fair amount for my dad's job, I had exposure to a number of different kinds of, of churches, which, you know, some like the Dutch reformed one were more liturgical in nature. And then some, you know, once we moved to Wisconsin, and were more like rowdy, you know, rock church band, like evangelical, what you think of with like hands in the air and all of that kind of thing. But yeah, my dad was mostly re- like lapsed Catholic, not interested in God and kind of just let my mom do her thing and raising my sister and I in the faith on her own. But then when I was in high school, my dad for whatever reason, kind of started to come with us to some uh, church events at this church, very small church plant that my mom had gotten involved with and that my sister and I were also consequently very involved with volunteering and all of that. It was a kind of mass baptism as happens from time to time. A bunch of people sign up to be baptized and it was at our local pool um, in this small town. And it was just a nice like summer evening. I think the relevant piece too here is that because it was a church plant and we were meeting in a movie theater, so we, like we didn't have our own building, you know, so it was either the options were kind of either rent a church space that would have their own little baptismal section or like, Another church I went to would have these big camping trips and like pe- the pastors would baptize people in the river. Like, you know, it's like you're getting baptized in a river or in a pool. That's what we were doing in Wisconsin. Can you just explain what a church plan is exactly for our listeners? Because oh, 
Yeah, absolutely. So a church plant is when a small group of people decide to form their own church. And this could either be completely independent of any organization, or alternately, they could, as was the case with ours, be splitting off from a larger church in order to go do their own thing. And they might be the same denomination as that church, or they could be choosing to be a different denomination. But yeah, it's just basically a new group of people who are deciding to you know, plant a new, a new church body. And so we were about, I think 40 or 50 strong at that point. And yeah, we're doing this big pool baptism. And my dad definitely had not (laughs) declared any intention to be part of it. But at one point, you know, he was with us that night and he just like fully impulsively jumped into the pool. I remember, um, the pastor and like the guys who were helping him like dunk the people. It was like all of these dads in polo shirts. That's what I remember. (laughs) Like just, that's what it looked like. Just fully dressed. And yeah, my dad just like jumped in like Wrangler jeans, his like steel toe work boots. He was probably wearing a t-shirt, just went for it. And your sense was kind of that it was like, you talk about Durkheim's The Collective Effervescence, I think. Is that the term? Mm -hmm. Is that right? And and that actually really resonated for me because it sounds like you really thought he really did get swept up in the moment, right? In the the sort of collective. Yeah. And like, I will say that my dad is, you know, it's been 20 plus years now and like, he's still a believer. So, so he's still in it. So like, obviously like this wasn't a temporary thing. Like he's very much still a believer. So it, you know, it worked for him <laughs> um, and such. When I found out that phrase for a bit from, from Dur- Emil Durkheim, the collective upper vessels, I was like, oh my gosh, that is absolutely what happens. Like in church services, at events like this baptism, at just at really powerful concerts, like everyone just kind of is so feeling this, like feeling really connected and feeling the same emotional highs and lows and swells. And, and it seemed like that, whether that was what moved my dad, I don't know. I've, I've never talked to him about what motivated him to jump in, but he did. And because you know, he got baptized and said the prayer of salvation and all of that. He then proceeded to become the spiritual head of our households. Like evangelicals are very invested in this idea of male headship and that men are in charge of their families and the spiritual direction of what's happening. So like the fact that my mom had 20 plus years under her belt (laughs) and had been doing this for a really long time, like doesn't matter it's my dad now. And he proceeded to take us away from that church and to a very different church in town that is the only church I've ever attended that I very firmly believe was a cult. And so, and, and I'm not the only person in from that town who has ever said that. You know, I did this whole investigation into the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. And I was really struck by your clarity about like knowing even as it was happening, what you were seeing and the evangelical dog whistles that were used and the just that deep sense that you write about of like recognizing the God that was being invoked on that day. Did you already know that you were going to be writing as much about the 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 weave between U.S. history and evangelicism before January 6th or did that kind of come in? later. I already knew that I was going to be doing it before and I already I already was doing it before but I I didn't realize how much of the present I was going to have to write about until January 6th. Like January 6th certainly was not <laughs> in the book, you know, until it happened and then I was like, oh, this has to be in the first chapter, you know. There's there's simply no version that ex- of this book that exists that can talk about how much of a grip this movement has on this country without t- like how irresponsible would it be of me to leave that out so not that it changed the the through line but it really brought those final conclusive points 
up much further into the present than it had previously, than I had previously thought it would. And it also made, I think, some of my concluding, not that I make really strong arguments as to what we should be doing now, because I'm I'm not a you know political theorist. I don't have the answer, but I think I made some much more damning statements than I would have otherwise. And I felt comfortable, I think, doing so in part because of how horrific last year was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it almost felt like, to me, speaking out about about it almost felt like a, a, like a kind of a moral requirement on a certain level, you know, because the if you understand or even are starting to understand the implications of, of what you saw, it's just profoundly alarming. But I wondered if you would talk to us a little bit about the God, the evangelical God that you recognized that day and how you, how you recognize that, that God. Yeah. And I, and I, I talk about this a little bit in the book and I don't get, I don't get too far into it, but I think that what was so striking to me in terms of recognizing immediately what was happening is because to me, the evangelical God that I grew up with is so militant and is so profoundly uh, the language of contemporary evangelical Christianity, you know, as you so like beautifully explore in your series is it's so baked in violence and it's so baked in justifying violence and in justifying war and specifically in justifying American war. I don't think it's a accident in any way. It's very much like causation here that the language of American evangelicalism is really utilized to justify American warmongering. It's like we have victory in Christ, you know, it's like the blood of Christ Jesus allows us freedom, which we then get to bring to the rest of the world. You know, there's this one children's song even that's called like Onward Christian oh, Soldiers I grew up or singing something. that song in church. Yeah. Marching right, us to war right. with so the cross like, of Jesus going on before, right? <laughs> right. So it's like, I shouldn't say it was funny to me, but it kind of was funny to me, all of this language that I was seeing. And I, again, I, I live in, I'm from the rural Midwest, but I, I live in, you know, I live in New York City now and I was in Boston before that for graduate school. So I, the circles I'm in now were very much like New York media and literary circles. And so what I was seeing were a lot of my peers in that being like, this isn't the Christian God, you know, isn't Jesus like loving? And I'm like, no, <laughs> American Jesus is very about war. And that is exactly what they're doing. Like they brought a cross and a gallows. Like that is not inconsistent with how we grew up and with how they utilize that language to, to talk about it. So I don't know. So that was very, it was just straight up consistent for me. Right. Um, I mean, I will yeah. say that like, I will say that the, I grew up going to a Dutch reform church in Westchester. And so it was a much more kind of moderate, low key kind of mm -hmm. smells and bells kind of very like, mm -hmm. like aestheticized mm -hmm. experience, which was lovely. But, you know, I'm sure if I went back, I'd see more uh, sort of subtext. And, but what really struck me reading your book was just how overt that sort of, you know, militaristic God, it, how overt the language, the militaristic language is around that God and the sense of guilt and punishment. And then I just wondered, so it was so specifically on January 6th, can you tell me a little bit more how it resonated with your experience of religion growing up? Yeah. In terms of how it personally resonated, you know, it was very much horrifying in that sense that, I mean, it was the most extreme and certainly one of the more violent imaginings of the kind of metaphorical language that the pastors I had grown up with would use because so much of, I think the culture wars get talked about a lot in secular media and there's not a lot of attachment to what that means, but in church that's used as a very fear mongering phrase. It's like, we're like, that's not, that's not a metaphor. Like it's a culture war. It's an active war. We're losing it. Like we need to take back our country for Christ. And what happened on January 6th was an active, quote unquote, taking back our country for Christ. And certainly it was not exclusively folks who were evangelical who were involved in that. That was very much a, a melding of people who were, you know, who were QAnon, who were far right, like, you know, far right militia types who were also even, and, and, but evangelicals were certainly involved in that. And that was the mindset 
that I would hear preached about. And the best faith interpretation is that I don't know that any of the pastors I grew up with imagined a mil- like that much of a militia style, we are going to try to kidnap and execute members of Congress. But that is the logical conclusion when coupled with that kind of ideology. And so in terms of having grown up, it just, I was very much watching it unfold and thinking of every sermon I've ever heard preached like that, because it's all like they're coming for you, right? It's all like they're coming, they're going to steal your house. They're going to steal your, they're going to steal your, your life, your job, your, your country, your wife, your daughters, your every, like it's, it's so baked in. I mean, obviously like that language is also in the white evangelical church. It's so baked into with a lot of like white supremacist, just awful racist, you know, that kind of language. And it's just very, it's very, you know, lots of dog whistles, but that's the kind of, we need to take it back. We need to reclaim it. And when you couple that with, you know, several years of Trump and, how far right the Republican Party has swung, that's what you get. And it's pretty much a lot of folks I know in my, I have a lot of folks in my life who are also ex evangelical, and none of us were. I mean, a lot of us were like staggered by what we saw and horrified by what we saw, but none of us were surprised per se by what we saw because that's what we grew up with. And then, but then so. there's also, it seems to me like there's also the, the focus on, end times and the the idea of the apocalypse and all of that i mean that's the culmination of of kind of the culmination of the bible right and so it's like mm-hmm. and particularly in like again like in in the more liberal suburban church that i grew up in like there wasn't nearly the the focus on end times and i also wonder these days if, if part of it is is the times that we're living in, I'm sure, has increased. But it's hard to know. It's like, I I guess what I mean to say is I see this strange kind of dovetailing where it's almost like there was this ongoing narrative that was almost waiting for Donald Trump to come riding in and agree to sort of lead it to its natural conclusion, to the narrative's natural conclusion, right? Yeah. I mean, what they got in Trump was, uh, I, I fully agree with that. And it's, uh, you know, th- what they got in him was a, <laughs> was someone who would say the quiet parts out loud. Yeah, exactly. Or the unspoken, or even the unspoken parts, right? The implicit. Exactly. And was someone who, it didn't matter that he, uh, he's obviously, I mean, again, this is kind of the orthodox, my orthodox upbringing coming out with how strictly I grew up and how particular, like, p- how particularly close we like hoed to the Bible. I'm like, he's, he's, he's obviously not a Christian. He's, you know, <laughs> like, etc. Like he's obviously never actually read any of it, but that doesn't matter because he's willing to say all the things he's willing to take them to their most extreme conclusion and he is willing to cut the brake lines and that is all they've been wait- like waiting for is someone who would cut the brake lines a- and that is what they got because all of these other candidates have I like I- ironically I think that some of their other candidates even Mike Pence who scares me a little as I will say, like as a lesbian, Mike Pence scares me far more in a lot of ways than Trump did. But someone like Pence, who is an arguably like much better Christian than a lot of. (laughs) Yeah, he has a code. It's a very questionable code, but it is a code, right? (laughs) There's a, but there's a code. There is a code. And he's not, because he has a code, problematic and horrible as it is, he's not going to cut certain lines. He's not going to break certain rules. He's going to respect like the certain bounds of governance that those folks on the far right are like, no, we like at all costs, we don't want that. And ironically, people who actually are of a certain ilk in the faith will not do that. So it's a very interesting irony. Well, there. yeah, you can like, you can kind of predict if you have a code, if a person has a code, you can kind of predict what they will and won't do. And to some extent, and with Donald Trump, I mean, that's been sort of the, the biggest consistent is just like, you're never really quite sure what, you know, what he's what going to do. do. Yeah. But even his election too, I think it was sort of, his election was not, not that it was not surprising to me, or not surprising to me because it, it both was and it wasn't. But the fact that so many evangelicals fell in line with him 
was also, I think, like when I when, once uh, once he had weeded, once all the other contenders were DOA in 2016, it was like, oh well, of course, evangelicals will fall in line with him. He's willing to say what they need to hear. And right. What they he's want willing to, hear. to sort of right, and he's willing to promise to take up the primary agenda, which is the you know overturning of Roe, right? And and, and here, we are. here we are. He did it. He has deli- he even <laughs> even though he is no longer in office, he absolutely. It was like as a business. I feel like the businessman part of him understood that if the one thing that he actually had to do, and yes. the, the one the one promise he had to make good on was that basically. And that is a hell of a promise to make good on to most Republicans, like and especially to evangelicals. Like that is that is what they've been writing on since, you know, since they coalesced around abortion, like since they decided collectively that segregation was too hot, like quote unquote hot button for them to publicly be coalescing around since they decided that abortion was the one they were going to do. Like that's been the gold standard of the party platform and he got it done. Just out of curiosity, I'm just curious to hear like, specifically how you would articulate your understanding of why outlawing abortion, why that became such a priority for the evangelical community. Because mm. there are people have different ideas and I'm, I'm just, you know a lot about the history of this. And so I am very curious to hear what your specific idea is. Yeah. So I, I will say my disclaimer there is that it's, I think it's incredibly difficult to untangle what about abortion? It's kind of a chicken or the egg, you know, does evangelical commitment to abortion come first or does Republican strategists coming into the churches and like meeting with pastors and helping, giving them talking points? That is an incredibly difficult knot to untangle there. So I will, I will say that as a, as a disclaimer. However, from my understanding, honestly, given that even in the early seventies, like upwards of 70% of Southern Baptist pastors were a okay with abortion in a wide range of cases for the emotional and mental health of the mother. It was a very abrupt swing that they made away from it at the behest and strategizing of Nixon's Southern strategy, like with Lee Atwater at the head of that. And also Jerry Falwell was very involved in this, founder of Liberty University. But Honestly, for evangelicals, I see it as being like how how hard they go for abortion these days. I see it as foundationally being, and I, not that many of them would say this, but as being a key to to underlying their commitment to racial purity, to white racial purity, because it's integral to their understanding of like biblical male headship and biblical womanhood and God's plan for the family. But really what they're getting at is like perpetuating the white nuclear family in the United States. And really what it's getting at is the idea of the keeping of one's own. So just being able to ensure that as many white babies are being born as humanly possible. Honestly, yes. And obviously like we know that a uh, limiting reproductive care has an absolute adverse effect on low-income women and on women of color. And so it also has the added benefit for white, wealthy Republicans of encouraging class stasis in the lower classes and of encouraging like what they see as a radically diminishing like white population. One of the things that also really moved me about your book was how brilliantly you sort of weave together that experience with your increasing education in grad school of yeah. of the history of puritanism in mm-hmm. in America and and the role that it has played in shaping this country. I was hoping you would talk a little bit about that because I think it's you know what's weird is like I know it from my own investigation, but also because I was raised my like my family is Protestants, but like I, my family, like they were Puritans, right? And they're like they're very very liberal people now. Like they're they've become full Democrats and like whatever. They're not. They've really shifted enormously. But I was really raised with this like hardcore kind of like work hard, like a lot of this Puritan ethics. Which so what's weird is like I knew a lot of this stuff, and then I I was reading it again, and I was shocked all over again. It's as if like it's just so pervasive in our in our air and in our culture and in our veins here that it's like it's just really easy to lose sight of it. And it 
it's, I just feel like it's so deeply woven into our sense of identity. I was really struck by that, and I was just hoping you would talk a little bit more about how that sort of Puritan ethic and that Puritan brand of Christianity has sort of been interwoven in, in U.S. history from the beginning. Yeah, it was really striking to me to, <laughs> and, and difficult, I will say, to to A, kind of articulate explicitly, as you say, like what's in the air. How do you, you know, how do you explicitly identify these ideas that are so baked in that we've just been imbibing them from the time that we, you know, were like starting to walk and attend. Well, and our identities churches, are like, woven up with mm-hmm. them. So it's like you feel yeah. almost under attack in this horrible yeah. way, right? Yeah. So it was it was a process to kind of figure out exactly which threads I wanted to pull out and then which ones and which ones I wanted to like really kind of trace back. And I could have spent a whole book just doing that. But the ones that I settled on were kind of as you as you allude to, this idea especially that is just so insidious and has really become so divorced, I think, from most people's understanding that it's religious in nature, that hard work equals being a good citizen, hard work equals actually being a good Christian, and that that's actually a profoundly puritanical and theocratic value in nature. Let's just pause for one second and just point out that the thing is, because this is, again, like something that could easily, I could just really, I could let it wash over me, but that the thing is that implicit in the idea of hard work is that work is punishing. Yep. That work is punishing. Hard and a large part of your existence requires punishment. Mm. No, that work is punishing. And then that the follow up to that is that work is in turn purifying and it's purifying of the soul. And that, but it, but those, both of those things are so key that like it's the two sides of the coin. Hers is going to hurt and then it's going to make you good, right? It's going to make you good. It's ultimately going to, and that's the goal. Without hard work, you are not okay. And that creates such self-loathing. It does. It, and, and, but that's the purpose also. is The purpose of hard work is to create self-loathing. And the idea is that, again, like that kind of self-admonishment, because it's, again, like this idea is profoundly, and when we're saying it's puritanical, we're linking it to the origins of like white settlement in this nation, which is like the Puritans, who themselves were Calvinists. And like bringing John Calvin's theology to this country and Calvinism is one of the like core tenets of Calvinism is that humans are profoundly like not good on their own and that you require the grace of God. You require the divine intervention because there is absolutely nothing human beings can do, think, will create that has any inherent goodness. Depravity, natural depravity. That's the phrase I was going for. I just think it's also important to make the connection there between this self-loathing that has been really profoundly bred into us and the ways that we've tried to escape it, right? Through dysfunctional, whether disordered eating or any kind of addiction, right? Oh my God. Absolutely. No, I so appreciate you saying that. Also, because I think for, I mean, and for people who are socialized like as women in the church, that is an inescapable like foundation of what is purportedly being a good Christian and what is purportedly being a good person is that kind of flagellation. You right? have to be our, tamed, like, there is- you have to be trained. You have to, right? You on your own are dangerous and scary and not okay. Exactly. Exactly. It's like we're daughters of Eve, where our bodies are sources of temptation. We can't be trusted. Like, whereas like from I mean, men get similar messaging, but it's it's tempered with that assumption that they will assume power because of the ideology of male headship, they will assume some kind of power, whether at the base level over their own like wives and children, or you know, over a career, over a country, even or a church congregation. But like women are not and gender is binary in evangelicalism. There is no space for queer people or trans folks. Like it's horrific. But like those of us who grow up as women in the church, like there is no such tempering. It is just total sublimation of self 24 seven. And that way from girlhood to womanhood, it's the complete self abnegation, which leads, I think so much to that, not only like decentralizing of identity, but just total loss of identity. And then as you're saying, the the bodily dissociation, right? You just want to get out of your body as often as possible because it's so, it feels wrong. 
it feels wrong and bad to be in yeah. your body. Which like which then leads to like different kind of like disordered behaviors, like mental health stuff. Just I mean, it's so pervasive and it totally like impacts us in ways that like though I think those of us, you know, who who leave the church, who get out, who who deconstruct and who find different ways of, you know, of being in faith in different ways like then are left with a lifetime of figuring out and untangling all of those really profoundly difficult and painful knots. Um, Can you talk a little bit about how that particular brand of Puritan Protestantism was woven into the power structures in this country, like how, how it has been perpetuated? Yeah, I mean, I think, and to to keep with the hard work, I think one of the primary ones is that the kind of, as America has, because Puritanism predates Americanism, right? And so I think that a lot of, and the Puritan, like the Puritan settlement in um, what is now Massachusetts Bay, well, I guess what they called Massachusetts Bay Colony too, their settlement was initially a theocracy. And, you know, they hung heretics and dissenters and they very much (laughs) didn't want anyone else there. Like they, they were trying to create this little idyllic religious paradise. I don't know. This whole narrative that the Puritans were like about religious freedom is wild to me. I didn't know they killed Quakers. I had no idea. Never no, once they, in my life had, had yeah, I heard I that. I mean, they literally had, like, King Charles had to send them missives, like, being like, hey, please stop hanging the other white people, basically, because we actually are trying to settle this part of <laughs> Because, of course, the mythology of this country cannot talk about how like it's founded on these people who were actually religious extremists whose idea of religious freedom is much more in line with what the current religious freedom bills are. That's actually, ironically, incredibly puritanical. Anyway, which is just to say that once these ideas of like, what is the, what is America? And like, we need a national mythology are start emerging in the early 19th century they really like cling on to some existing puritanical ideas around hard work equals being a good citizen. They just strip it of the theology and they just really like in terms of around the art, the literature, the policy, the speech making, and a lot of the early innovators um, in the American like political theorists and whatnot really start to associate that language. Just, yeah, that being a, being a good citizen, being a good American is about working hard and is about self-sacrifice. And it's all, basically you just, you replace religion with America. And so America becomes the religion. But I do think a lot of it is very insidious in that, that, mythology of like the self-made American, which really comes in like post-Civil War. You know, the pull yourself up by your bootstraps, like that, that idiom I don't think really comes into play until even like the early 20th century. But like the this this idea though of being self-made, it really invisibilizes generational wealth and the idea that and it really encourages the idea that anyone who is seen to be successful or who is celebrated has obviously worked hard. And has obviously done, you know, and so the idea then that like, oh, Donald Trump, he just worked really hard. Like he inherited so much money. We have a culture that really celebrates rags to riches and a culture that really celebrates exceptionalism. And that's, but that's a feature, not a bug. Like it, it's really designed to put veils between the public and understanding how much support those at the top actually get. And certainly how much those at the top who, and certainly in the early days of this country, like how many like of the founding fathers owned slaves and how many of them were exploiting indentured servants and how many of them ultimately were exploiting factory workers and child laborers and horrific conditions during the industrial revolution. None of that really gets I mean, it's getting more talked about now, but that kind of language and that kind of understanding of where, like, where does wealth come from? Where does success come from in this country? Like, we want it to come from one person and we want it to come from their hard work. And we don't appreciate, I'm using we very generally right now, but like, we don't want it to come from a a system supporting them or a family lineage or. I mean, there's there's this other thing that occurred to me while 
uh, that while you were talking, which is just that like, even in terms of, um, I mean, I worked in magazines for a long time, right? And I worked at, I worked mm-hmm. at fashion magazines for a while and the mythology of, of wealth and like this idea that everybody you would see in a fashion magazine was somehow wealthy or just so good at looking wealthy that everybody would assume that they were wealthy. And that mm. in a weird way that that creates this whole support thing, but also that like, I'm just remembering basically that there were these celebrities even like 10 years ago who were getting really fit and who were getting mm. like these incredibly like beautifully sculpted, like two hours a day kind of bodies. And even 10 years ago would say things like, I mean, people ask me how I do it and I just, you know, I'm busy too, but I have priorities. I make it a priority. And like, I don't, I don't mean to be bitchy. I really just want to point out how deranged that thinking is, right? That most women have access to that kind of time, that most women can afford the kind of domestic slash help slash childcare, whatever else slash leisure to devote that kind of time, right? The implicate, but what, what's being said is, no, you just didn't prior, you didn't work hard enough, right? Oh, I so feel that. I remember reading all of that. And I remember too, like during the, like when, I feel like when girl boss, like when white girl boss feminism super peaked a few years ago, there was this mug going around that had, what it was something like, you have the same 24 hours in a day as Beyonce, right? And I love Beyonce. Okay. Like I, I grew up with her. Like I love her. And also I am very aware that I in no way have the team that she has. Like, like, it's like, yes, we're both human beings living on planet earth. Yes. We both have the same 24 hours, but we don't have the same 24 hours. And that is such an unfair thing to tell people. It just makes you hate yourself again. It makes you think that you suck. It makes you think it that, that and th- it, it cements this idea that like, you're just not working hard enough. Right. Right. When it, when no amount of hard work is going to be enough. And those are like celebrity examples. Those are the exceptions and the, the celebrated, like, look, she did it. You can do it too. Like when, no, you can't, like <laughs> there is no amount of hard work that's going to equal an entire team of chefs and personal stylists and as you said, like whatever. But, but also I think about the systemic injustices in this country and how no amount of hard work is enough to make up for a gender pay gap or like queer, like laws on the books, allowing queer dis- like discrimination. Hard work isn't enough for that. And the corollary to, to the hard work messaging that you hear in evangelical churches is this idea that it's just God's will and that any individual circumstance that befalls you, like good or ill or any tragedy or such, well, that was just God's will. Like that all of these different, you know, like horrifying and like systemic like deaths of black folks, like at the hands of police. Oh, that's just God's will. Are you like, are you kidding me? It just, it's, it's a way to paint brush over like systemic injustices and a way to really abdicate responsibility both personally but also like as a powerful or like religious organization that has a lot of political power right it's like oh we don't have we can't help there we don't you know exactly. we've, we've done what we can like and they could exercise it they they could do something but they actively choose not to and and that is just such an endemic like moral failing i think on the part of of the church in this country the white church in this country especially but i know a lot of people who feel really guilty or who don't want a, a lot of white people who don't want to look at stuff because they feel bad so they just don't look and i just want to say like a lot of this is just big giant structures monoliths that we can't be scared of looking at and 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 we have to recognize the role that those monoliths have played and those narratives play if we're going to do anything yeah and cause, again cuz to i love that you bring that up because to that point of the like also the hard work equals good like godly citizen hard work equals good american citizen hard work is all about what you can do and in addition to like invisibilizing how 
hard work like actually functions, it keeps the focus on the individual and it keeps the focus entirely off, as you're saying, the systems. And it keeps you looking at looking down and looking at you and maybe looking at your family or looking at your friends, and looking at the people around you. But this idea that the responsibility is entirely with the person and not in any way with other systems or with your government or with your church or your school or an institution, that's by design. So that was my talk with Gina, our final interview of the control variable for this season. I've loved talking with all of you this past year, thinking through this crazy time with you, wondering where we go from here how we might move forward in a better way. I've learned so much about America these last 18 months. And there are two things in particular that stay with me. The first one is how deeply flawed our country's founding story is. And I hate saying that. I hate saying it because part of me still loves that story. It was my story as a kid, you know? I dressed up as Betsy Ross for Halloween when I was five. My little sister went as the American flag. And she will probably never forgive me for saying that out loud. But it's true. I believed in the myth of white American greatness, of white American specialness. The idea, basically, that white Americans, and white American men especially, are better than everyone else. It was taught everywhere when I was growing up. In our schools, in our churches, in malls, in our businesses, in our movies, on our TVs, and in our magazines, and our advertising in Washington and on Wall Street, in our sports arenas, and in Hollywood. And sadly, that myth was taught in a way that has supported and perpetuated white privilege here in America for the last 250 years. This is the truth that I learned during my investigation. I felt it in my bones. I know we can't go forward like this here in America. I know we have to change. Now, stay with me, because the second big thing I learned also has to do with a crucial American story, a much more recent one, which is the story of American meritocracy. My amazing guest, Harvard philosopher Michael Sandel, taught me about it. He calls it the tyranny of merit. And it's the idea that America is a level playing field for everyone, and that if you just work hard and go to college, you will succeed, which sounds like a great idea on the surface, right? Unfortunately, this idea has a really dark underbelly, which is if you don't succeed, it's your fault and no one else's. You just didn't work hard enough. You didn't try hard enough. And sadly, this idea of meritocracy, this story that college is the answer, leaves almost half the country in the dust. And even worse, it's an idea that fundamentally disrespects those people. It fundamentally disrespects anyone who doesn't aspire to a higher education and city life, to corporate dominance and big technology and a race to the future. It's a story that's left millions of people feeling profoundly disillusioned about the American dream. It's left them feeling angry and frustrated, increasingly inclined towards populism. In other words, easy pickings for someone like Donald Trump. So we're divided here in America between a very old story that leaves out millions of people, and a newer story that offends millions of other people at a fundamental level. It's clear our divisions aren't going to go away anytime soon, but I keep wondering if there's room for a third American story, one that might bring us back together and move us forward at the same time toward a more democratic, more just, and more free future. We'll keep working on it. In the meantime, I've loved making this show with you guys and for you guys, talking to you about this beautiful, messy country of ours and how to keep living in it. People often ask me, what's the control variable? Like, why is your show called the control variable? Well, in the beginning, the idea was that facts would be the control variable on this show. But after a while, it became clear that facts alone weren't going to solve the problems we're dealing with in America right now. That yes, facts are real and they are crucial. But even more crucial is compassion, is love. And I think if we ever start to take love as seriously as we take fear, well, then anything would be possible. All right, you guys, that's it for now. Before I go, I want to thank my fellow creators of The Control Variable, Jonathan Wilson, Brian Blatstein, and Rob Okendo, 
In the dark months after January 6th of 2021, you guys came to me with an idea for a podcast that was impossible to resist. And I'm so proud of what we created together. Thank you so much for your faith and support. It's meant everything. I also want to thank my incredible team for all their hard work and support, especially Megan Petta for keeping the whole ship afloat, and Derek Michaud and Alex Aerosmith at Shelby Row Productions for editing the podcast and making me sound good, and Eric Tortara Patu for making the social media magic possible. You guys are the best. All right, everybody, that's it for now. I'm Kim Cutter. Thank you so much for joining me on The Control Variable. See you soon.